Hello there, tis I, your friendly neighborhood Wombo, and you've already seen the title so you know what time it is. It's time to rage bait some Mandalorian fans. I know this video will be met with a lot of apprehension, seeing as how Season 1 is regarded by most fans as top tier Star Wars content. If you don't care to hear the preamble, skip to this time code. For those of you interested, I'd like to cover all my bases before jumping in. First, I want to thank everyone who's watched my previous videos, and an extra big thank you to everyone who subscribed. The Blackwater video especially has done way better than I ever expected, and I really appreciate all the love you guys sent my way. I had high hopes for this channel, but did not expect that much traction so early in its life. Seriously, thank you. I'll be discussing my future plans for the channel at the end of the video, which will be at this time code. So why am I making this video, and why did I title it Worse Than You Remember? Well, dear viewer, I regret to inform you that that is not clickbait. Season 1 is kinda dog shit. Now, when I first saw this season, I did like it. I liked it a lot, in fact. Like many people, I watched this show with friends and wasn't giving it too much thought, but the visuals, music, and premise were more than enough to get me excited to see where this all might be headed. And it wasn't until finishing the second season that the disappointment began to set in and I felt compelled to rewatch season one. When I did, I was shocked to find that it crumbles the minute you start to ask questions. The entire story is incoherent nonsense and every time I rewatch an episode, I only spot more issues. But if what I'm saying is true, then why did most viewers love it and still hold it in high regard? Well, you can enjoy or like something for any reason. I think this whole season is dumb as hell, but I don't think you have to be dumb to like it, or the other two seasons for that matter. That's right, even the third. There are a lot of reasons to have liked the first season. There are a lot of reasons to like the other two. As for this one, maybe you liked it because of the stellar visuals and the awesome music. Maybe you liked it because it came out after The Last Jedi and it felt like Disney was finally giving you something you wanted. Maybe you liked it because you got stoned with your friends and had a really fun time following Mando around your favorite galaxy far, far away. Hell, maybe you liked it because, unlike me, you really enjoyed the story. But whether or not you enjoy something is completely subjective. I like the prequels, but I won't be caught dead telling anyone that they are good movies, or more specifically, good stories. Because when you say something is good as opposed to saying you like it, you're making a claim about the inherent quality, not just your personal preferences. You can't be wrong for how you feel about something or your preferences, but you can be wrong for claiming that something poorly made is well made. Saying The Mandalorian is exciting or interesting aren't things I can or even care to argue against. I can tell you I personally didn't find it exciting or interesting, but that doesn't make your feelings less valid. However, trying to call the story in The Mandalorian good is like saying a car that randomly shuts off in the middle of traffic is a good car. Stories should make sense and follow a logical progression of events. Just like cars should get the driver and passengers from point A to point B. I would argue that story, which includes characters, setting, and plot, is the most important aspect of any piece of television. Because film is a storytelling medium, so the story is the most fundamental component and I make the case that a good story is one that remains internally consistent. It adheres to its own continuity. If you remain internally consistent when writing a narrative, a few things will happen that make your story rewarding to watch and or rewatch. I think the most important byproduct of adhering to continuity is that you will make everything that happens more believable. A good story in this sense is like a really good lie. When you ask yourself questions about what is happening, a good story will provide you with satisfying answers that are consistent with everything you've been shown thus far. The same applies to characters. Much like an actual human, a character can do something unexpected or seemingly out of character, but a good story will either provide reasonable justification for why that character had a change in their perspective, or reveal that the character was acting in accordance with a consistent motivation the entire time. This serves to make the viewer invested because it no longer feels like they're just consuming a story. It makes them feel like they're peering into an alternate universe. One that, like our own, operates under cause and effect. The laws of that universe may be different than our own, but there are still laws. Let's look at some examples. Why does Luke turn off his targeting computer in the infamous trench run from A New Hope? Well, we established that the targeting system isn't 100% reliable. Even fully locked on, there is a chance that it will fail. It can get you really close to the target, but even a well-honed machine has trouble nailing such a difficult shot. One character in the film even tries to claim that it's impossible. The Force, on the other hand, is basically space magic. By putting his faith in his connection to the Force, which is established in several moments prior to be abnormally strong, Luke is able to land a one in a million shot that no human or computer could reliably pull off. He already saw a veteran pilot fail to make the same shot with his own targeting system, and he hears the disembodied voice of his recently deceased mentor, telling him to let go and put his trust in the Force. The same mentor who demonstrated to him earlier in the film that the Force can be used to accomplish things that should be statistically impossible. Luke has more reason in this moment to think the Force will help him nail this shot 
robot than the targeting system he just saw fail, and the force being used to destroy this seemingly unstoppable superweapon was foreshadowed earlier in the film by Darth Vader. A bad story, on the other hand, is like a bad lie. When you contradict yourself while telling a lie, people will notice and suddenly everything you've told them will come into question. Similarly, when a story repeatedly contradicts itself, it makes it really hard for the viewer to take anything seriously because they know the story will bend reality if and when it needs to. Take the Holdo maneuver from The Last Jedi. If you can use light speed to ram your ship into something, why has this never been done before? Why didn't the Rebels just plop a droid into an empty ship and have it hyperspace kamikaze straight into the Death Star? Shouldn't this be the go-to move for every space battle? Why ever Ever make a Death Star at all when you could spend a fraction of the resources making ships designed to weaponize light speed? If Holdo was willing to try this, then why did she wait to do it well after watching hundreds of her comrades die? If this maneuver really is one in a million, as the next movie tries to tell you, then why did Hux and his crew look terrified as if they knew it was going to work? The simple answer to all these questions is that the writer really wanted this cool moment, and he wasn't going to let pesky logic get in the way. And you might be sitting there thinking, just shut your brain off and have fun, you nerd, but that's just an mission that this is bad writing. If your audience has to not think about the story in order for the story to work, then that means the story doesn't work. When you establish rules in your story only to completely ignore them later, or when you establish a character's motivation only to spontaneously change it for specific scenes, it tells the audience that anything can happen so long as it serves your narrative. It makes the world less believable and can ruin any sense of tension the audience has because they've now seen that the continuity of your story will be discarded the second it comes between the writer and the payoff they want to achieve. These examples are mostly to do with world and plot, which I would argue people care far less about than characters, but I will get to that soon enough. The point I'm trying to highlight here is that a good story rewards you for paying attention and asking questions, while a bad story punishes you for paying attention and asking questions. Which brings us to season one of The Mandalorian. Even though I was initially underwhelmed by this first season, it still had so much going for it that I was convinced it would only get better. Mando's character premise on paper is pitch perfect. I'll go in depth on that in a later video, but all that needs to be said for now is that The Mandalorian has all the ingredients of a show I should love. The music is fantastic, the visuals are top notch, the premise is rock solid, it's a smaller scale story told in a universe I love, it leans super hard into old western tropes, and it's the classic story of a grumpy badass transforming into a wholesome dad. How could it not be good? The Mandalorian may have all the bells and whistles of a good show, but it dies in execution because of all the things it lacks. Competent writers communicate communicating and collaborating with one another, a plan for the story beyond the first season, a commitment to telling a compelling or even cohesive narrative, that shit was never there. That's why, despite most people saying otherwise, I really don't think The Mandalorian gets much worse in quality as it progresses. I think it only becomes more painfully apparent how devoid of substance it's always been. I'm gonna lay out all the opportunities myself and many others saw in the show, and I aim to demonstrate that from the very beginning, the show had a ridiculous amount of promise, and the writers managed to squander just about every opportunity they were given, and they've been doing it since the very first episode. We open on our mysterious new protagonist, holding what appears to be a tracking device. Star Wars has begun most of its on-screen showings prior to this with music to set the tone. This show instantly sets itself apart by starting without any music. The echoing pulse from the tracking fob is all we get. With the absence of and any music following it, the viewer already gets the feeling that we're about to slow down and zoom in on a smaller part of this galaxy. This isn't a story about the Galactic War or the Skywalker bloodline. It's a story about one guy and his personal journey set in this universe. We jump to the bar and a fishman is getting harassed by some thugs. I like the design of the fishman. It's pretty minimal, but it's a definite step up from the Marvel approach of just painting him blue and calling it a day. Mando makes his grand entrance and says nothing. And I mean nothing. He walks in, sees his bounty, and spots three obstacles in his way. When they try to beef with him, he saunters over to the bar and just stands there like an NPC. The head goon accuses Mando of spilling his drink, and Mando continues to play the quiet game. These silent shenanigans then prompt all three goons to surround him. In an effort to de-escalate, the bartender offers them a drink on the house and begins to pour it. Head honcho then asks if Mando's armor is real Beskar. This is the first time most fans have heard the term Beskar, and this is a subtle way of alerting us to its value and rarity. The goons press in, and the leader slashes Mando's chestplate 
plate with his knife. The bartender finishes pouring the drink and slides it across the bar, and then this happens. I think this one fight alone hooked everybody, myself included. It's nothing grand or acrobatic, but it's markedly unheroic and surprisingly brutal. The cold and mechanical way in which Mando takes them out tells you that this guy is good at what he does, and he doesn't care how many kids you're watching, he's gonna get his hands dirty. He reveals himself as a bounty hunter, and we get a creative spin on the classic, dead or alive, you're coming with me. In a matter of minutes, the show makes a promise. This is not your typical Star Wars protagonist. He's no virtuous Jedi or charming smuggler. He's a cold and hardened killer, an efficient and no-nonsense badass. He gets the job done no matter how grisly, and he doesn't fraternize with his bounties no matter how innocent or friendly they might seem. The music really drives the point home, though. Most Star Wars music since the first film has either been made by John Williams or tried to recreate that same tone. Mando's music, on the other hand, says, nah, I'ma do my own thing. The theme is no exception. It's very reminiscent of the wailing melody of the good, the bad, and the ugly, but with a little Mandalorian twist on it. This is a decent opening for the show, but there's a little red flag at the end of this fight. The door slice is cool, but it's not very practical. Rather than grapple the guy, manually reel him into position, and shoot the door panel, just shoot him in the back. It's minor and doesn't impact the plot, but this is our first first example of Mando making less than optimal decisions for the sake of theatrics. Other than that, and the awkward silence, this is a strong start for the show. But maybe I'm wrong about the door slice. Maybe shooting a retreating enemy in the back is simply against Mando's code. It's possible Mando was just trying to prevent this guy from getting help, and only chose to kill him after he pulled out a gun and shot him. Maybe this is meant to show us that Mando does what he can to avoid unnecessary killing, to the point of risking his own life in the process. Perhaps this is the kind of outcome he gets so often, that it's pushed him to become less compassionate and trusting as time has gone on, because he gets punished every time he tries to show mercy. The show fails to follow this up, so I'm inclined to believe this is me being way too charitable. Jon Favreau wanted a door slice because he thought it was cool, and I've already put way more thought into it than he ever cared to. Mando goes to call a cab, and the first one called is piloted by a droid. It's squeaky clean, brand new, and Mando is having none of it. What is this? Droid racism? You know what? Not a bad idea. For bounty hunter work, droids are seriously overpowered if used correctly, and refusing to work with them could become problematic in a lot of situations. This is a creative hurdle for him to overcome and a smart way of nerfing him early on in the show. It also raises more than a few eyebrows. No droids? Like, any kind of droid ever? What did droids ever do to this guy? The choice to have the droid speeder be shiny and new while the human speeder is falling apart is played for a joke. The speeder doesn't break down or anything, but it could have, and that's a risk Mando was eager to take. Mando paying extra for a worse ride is a great way of foreshadowing that his droid prejudice is a character flaw that will both impact his decision making and potentially provide consequences for him to grow from. Spoilers, it won't. I have to ask, why land speeders? There's barely even a windscreen. Why not something closed so you can keep warm? Is it just so we don't have to come up with anything new? Is it just so we can cram in another reference to a new hope? The taxi driver warns them to keep off the ice. There be monsters lurking in the water. This is the first of many dumb monster attacks and the first Mando's many questionable parking spots. The examples in the future get much, much worse, so for now, let's just focus on the good. I quite like Mando keeping his cool being highlighted by his companion's utter panic. This would be terrifying to a civilian, but a trained spacefaring warrior like Mando has no issue keeping his wits about him in situations like this. You get the feeling that this is just another Tuesday in his world, and he's likely faced threats far worse. This is also the first time we see Mando's rifle. It can disintegrate people in one shot, and the end has an electric prod capable of hurting creatures of enormous stature. This is one of, if not the, best pieces of equipment Mando has. Therefore, the choice to leave it on the ship is a bit surprising, but we'll discuss his use of equipment in depth later, so let's put a pin in that for now. After a narrow getaway, Mando starts playing the quiet game again. His captive tries to get some sign of life out of him, but to no avail. Blue Man asks to use the bathroom, and when Mando doesn't reply, he sees himself out. Just say sure, Mando. I know you're supposed to be the strong silent type, but you can be the strong silent type without actually being mute. You told him to get out of the speeder a minute ago, so why are you being all hush-hush now? Also, not sure letting a bounty, even a handcuffed one, walk around your ship unattended is the best idea. But hey, I'm sure Mando knows what he's di- What the fuck, Mando? Why would you not have this shit locked up? Especially if you're gonna let random people go on self-guided tours of your ship. This is gonna become a pattern, by the way. The blue man pokes around some more, and Mando sneaks over and insta-freezes him. The carbonite reveal is kinda cool, but the Mando jump scare is just dumb. Boom, motherfucker! Why sit there and do not 
disturb mode and listen to him ramble when you're just going to carbonite him anyway? If you don't want to talk or get information out of him, then why are you seemingly waiting for him to wander over there on his own? What if he didn't go down there on his own? Would you have silently grabbed him and just started dragging him downstairs? Or would you, I don't know, say something? The only reason for him to behave this way is for the mystery factor and the spooky carbonite reveal. And while we're here, I thought it was made explicit in Empire Strikes Back that it's risky to use this on people. It was never meant for transporting living humans. Who knows what it might do to this random assortment of aliens. The show even lampshades this in the next season. I can't imagine how Mando would have perfected this craft himself or be one of the few to know about it since he doesn't even know who Boba Fett is when he meets him later. So am I meant to believe that the Carbonite method has become widespread knowledge? If a broke-ass bounty hunter is using it as his main way of transporting his captives, then you'd think all official prisoner transport in the galaxy would be done this way. We will come to see that this is not the case. Mando seems to be the only character with this tech. We never get an explanation as to how he got this super compact Instafreeze version, and he never uses it again. That's right, never. It's just here because Favre, I mean Mando, loves Star Wars references. His rifle is from the Holiday Special after all. Technically, his armor is from the Holiday Special too, seeing as how that was Boba Fett's first appearance. Now those are some humble roots. I will say now that the visuals are great. When compared to the rest of the Star Wars shows, the production value for this first season is second only to Andor. There's a lot of amazing CGI and practical effects being used, and it's all very nice to look at. But now is a good time to say that the quality of the visuals is only a slight bonus in the show's favor. The show should look good. It's a Star Wars show made by Disney. That quality will always be appreciated, but I don't have much to praise when the visuals aren't servicing the story. Mando rocks up to the second bar in the episode. Imagine spending this much time in bars and never being able to have a drink. And here we meet Grief Karga, the leader of Mando's bounty hunting guild. Oh, that was fast. This is another good way of telling us Mando is good at what he does. He wrangles bounties so quickly, it still surprises those familiar with him, even his own employer. On the other hand, this little currency exchange makes no sense. He tries to pay Mando in Imperial credits, and Mando reminds Karga what time period we're in. Karga says, fine, I'll give you Calamari Flan, or Flan, whatever, but I can only pay half. What? Wait, Mando accepts? What just happened? What is this 4D chess bargaining strategy? This would be like if I put a bounty out for 50,000 US dollars, and then when someone tries to bring in the bounty, I try to pay them with 50,000 Chuck E. Cheese tokens. When they try to keep the bounty, I offer them 25,000 US dollars worth of Chinese yen. It's still half of the agreed amount, Mando. Why are you so chill about this? He seems annoyed, but only slightly. He either doesn't realize how bad he just got swindled, or is somehow used to getting pranked like this. Now, there could be an answer here. The easy one being that Mando is on the wrong side of the law, so screwing him out of fair prices is a lot easier than it would be for, say, New Republic sanctioned bounties. But despite Mando supposedly having a sketchy past, he has nothing on his criminal record until the sixth episode of this season, and all of his bounties, aside from Baby Yoda, are actual criminals. So this is official work, and I guess he's just getting swindled? By Carl Weathers, no less. Grief shows him five bounties, and when Mando tries to take them all, he says, not so fast. Mando asks why business is so slow, and Grief says business isn't slow. People just don't want to pay guild rates. They don't care if things get sloppy. So guilds only accept proficient hunters so they can charge higher prices, but these extra proficient hunters don't see any of that benefit? I mean, they must, right? So you're telling me these are some of the highest paid bounties in the parsec from an expensive and esteemed guild, and yet these bounties can't even cover fuel? My assumption was that a bounty hunter guild was kind of like a union, but it seems more like a pyramid scheme. Is Carl Weathers actually swindling all of his hunters. I think I'd like my money back. All he does is act as the middleman between hunters and clients and keeps tabs on the tracking fobs. Maybe other guilds do it better, but this one sucks. There's no benefits. There's no guaranteed pay, no retirement plan, no system of coordinating with other hunters, no rules preventing other members from competing with you for the same quarry. If you join this guild, you get nothing. nothing. You lose. The guild makes no sense, and the show even realizes this, which is why Mando stays in it, but it's never spoken of again after season one. Well, not never. We get one mention, and it's basically a joke about how Mando is still enrolled, but has not been attending class. Despite the show being about a seasoned bounty hunter, we learn basically nothing about bounty hunting as a profession, or bounty hunter guilds as factions. We're told that Mando is a super elite hunter, but has to settle for shit pay because, eh, don't think about it. Just enjoy the ride. Grief then offers him a special assignment. It's a direct commission. 
Face to face, no bounty puck, deep pocket, psycho mantis. It sounds dangerous yet promising. Mando takes the ID card and pieces out. No wonder he's such a good hunter. Grief doesn't even tell him who or where the mystery client is and Mando walks straight to them. The mystery client turns out to be part of an Imperial remnant. That's pretty cool. It makes sense that the Galactic Empire would take time to die out. Some dude barges in and Mando instantly has his weapons drawn. This is some solid characterization for him and I appreciate him spurging out like this. The Empire and the Mandalorians don't exactly mix and this guy hunts people for a living, so it follows that he would have a PTSD-fueled quick draw. Mando gets to flex a bit, and so does this Empire guy. Wait. Are we gonna get some depth to the Empire? I'm not asking for much, just characters loyal to the Empire that aren't straight up cartoon villains. And yeah, we are, but I'll save that for when I cover episode 3. They tell Mando that they can't give him a bounty puck, which is essentially just a holographic wanted poster. Mr. Empire says this is for discretion, but the real reason is that we gotta save the Baby Yoda face reveal for the end of the episode. It makes no sense for them not to show him. He's gonna see what the bounty looks like anyway before he can bring it in, so why hide the fact that it's a cute little baby? What if Mando doesn't appreciate this epic twist and decides to take the child to the authorities. You should absolutely be showing him the puck beforehand just in case this is a deal breaker. They can only offer him the last known coordinates and a tracking fob. Mando takes his down payment of Beskar and bounces. The music really starts to bop once we reach the Mandalorian hideout. It's not a very impressive hideout, but that's fine. This could mean that these Mandalorians are just very minimalistic and not concerned with decorum. And hey, I like that angle. Mandalorians have a very checkered warrior history and their planet got all but destroyed. It makes sense that some of the survivors of the Purge would go on to be warrior monks, single-minded nomads dedicated to the preservation of their ancient culture. Here in the Teenage Mando Ninja Sewers, we meet this Mandalorian blacksmith, or Beskar Smith, if you will. Her costume is fucking sick, and it immediately makes you excited to learn more about the archaic and mystical aspects of Mandalorian culture. Mando places before her his bounty payout and the Beskar. We don't see or hear of her taking the money, and cash is apparently tight, so I think the implication here is that Mando keeps the money, and this was just him presenting his spoils to her. Maybe I'm supposed to assume he donated it to the Creed or something? But an alternative reading is that this is why Mando does what he does. It's not about the money or his reputation as a bounty hunter, it's about proving himself worthy in the eyes of his warrior Creed. And I really like this little forging montage of her shaping Mando's pauldron. It's intercut with flashbacks to his tragic backstory and the music continues to pop off. I can't wait to see a bunch more of these as he collects Beskar to make his armor. Yeah, that's not gonna happen. Well, I can't wait to get more on that tragic backstory. I'm sure it'll be super relevant. The armor says the excess will sponsor many foundlings, and Mando says, good, I was a foundling. Weird. You'd think she might already know that, but I get- I know. Well, surely he knows you know. Why did he even say it? He said it for the viewer, that's why. I'm not even sure why this is something we need to know yet. We could have just found out when we saw the rest of the flashback. Mando returns to his ship and departs for his next mission. When he arrives on Discount Tatooine, he pulls out his tracking fob before surveying the area. These little things make absolutely zero sense, by the way. I'm not gonna talk about them, and trust me, you don't want me to. Don't ask questions about the fobs. There are no answers, only more questions. He spots some floompy looking fish dinosaurs in the distance, and we get the cliche looking through the scope jump scare. I have no clue how this thing managed to sneak up on him, but at least it results in this epic fight scene. What the fuck was that? I thought this guy was supposed to be a badass. Would his first instinct really be to drop his disintegration rifle and bust out the flamethrower? How cool would it have been if, instead of getting spooked, Mando just fired the rifle without even flinching? If you don't want to shoot it for some fucking reason, just poke it with the cattle prod. We've already seen it hurt a creature 20 times the size, and yeah, there was water involved, but either way, I'm sure it would still put this thing on its ass. This sequence only gets worse once the beast has him by the arm. Mando has a vibro knife, which can apparently instigate kill a fucking mudhorn. So why doesn't he use that instead of punching it like some noob? Hell, why not try and grab your blaster? And fine, it would be hard to unholster it with the opposite hand while being yanked around like this. But what about when the second one charges him? Why does he try to use the force instead of pulling out his blaster then? If this happened to a normal person, they might be too overwhelmed to act accordingly. But I thought this guy was supposed to be the best bounty hunter in the parsec. Shouldn't he be accustomed to having to react appropriately to sudden danger, which he is in some episodes, sometimes. This is especially jarring when compared to how well he kept his cool when faced with a much bigger threat earlier in the same episode. I don't know, it's just a little frightfully embarrassing that Mando would be dead 25 minutes into his own show if he hadn't been saved by this random blurg farmer. Yeah, these things are called blurgs, by the way, as if Mando wasn't just humiliated enough. Of all the places you could randomly park, you not only put yourself in blurg country many miles away from your destination, but you happen to land next to one of the few people 
wandering this barren desert planet, and he's a certified Blurg Wrangler? Honestly, what are the chances? It's approximately 3,720 to 1! Never tell me the odds. Discount Yoda says he'll help Mando, and the two have a chat back at his farm. Discount Yoda tells Pedro that the only way to the Baby Yoda convention is by riding a Blurg, so he's gotta train one of the two they just tranquilized. Damn, how long is that gonna take? These things tried to kill him the moment they saw him. They must take ages to tame, let alone mount and ride. Oh, it just takes an afternoon? And the thing doesn't even try to attack him? As he repeatedly tries to mount it? Shit, are the animals gonna be written just as inconsistently as the people? Discount Yoda tells Rando to remove his helmet, and he ignores the comment. Is this a Mandalorian rule you have to follow to be part of the club? Outsiders can't see you unless you're wearing your armor? I sure hope it's that, and not something totally stupid. Mando gets frustrated and asks, Do you have a land speeder or speeder bike that I could hire? Great question, Mando. But don't worry, I can handle this. Isn't there a land speeder or a speeder bike he can hire? The way is impossible to pass without a blur. Mount. Impossible? I don't know if I really buy that. Impossible. You're telling me a land speeder wouldn't work better than this thing? The best explanation we get is that you need a blurg to jump all these cracks, but I don't think there's a single gap these things can jump that a land speeder couldn't easily glide over. The crack epidemic doesn't even seem that bad. Surely there are other routes Mando could take, and there are, he does later. This is needlessly contrived, and you can repair it quite significantly with some small changes. So let's try it. Mando wants the element of surprise, and his enemies are surrounded by mountains. A lot like these ones, but think much steeper. He can't use his ship without giving himself away, and climbing himself would take ages. So make the blur good at scaling steep mountains instead of good at jumping small gaps. Mando can ride up and down the mountain silently and use the cover of darkness to slip in completely unnoticed. Or fuck it make the cracks bigger and the blurgs jump farther. Because as it stands, Discount Yoda is straight up capping. Flying off-world to rent a speeder and coming back would be infinitely quicker than the weeks or months it would reasonably take to tame this wild alien. Double fuck it. Why not buy a speeder while you're at it? Are you going to tame a wild animal or call a cab every time you need to traverse a planet? Are you going to park in a random spot on every planet you visit and just hoof it to the nearest quest marker? Yes. The answer to both of those questions is yes. Discount Yoda evades the question and tells him to just mando up. Oh, he didn't think of that. Quill invokes the Great Mythosaur, which is a smart way of referencing the lore and a natural way for a stranger to try and amp up a Mandalorian he knows nothing about personally. Our titular protagonist tries again and immediately succeeds. Wow, incredible. Now, I know why they can't make this take as long as it should. Mando spending months taming a fishosaur would be super lame and make him look like even more of a buffoon. So why not make it something better than a blurg? Why not set this in a swamp or a dense jungle where Mando is forced to park away in a fast-moving terrain-specialized mount is actually necessary? You could beef up the blurg, maybe make it more like Obi-Wan's iconic lizard dog, and then Mando can show off a bit more when he fights it and doesn't have to look like such a chump if he needs to be rescued. And it would make it far more believable that this animal couldn't be replaced by a land vehicle. As is, Baby Yoda seems like the easiest bounty ever. There's like 20 random space pirates guarding him in the middle of a fucking desert. You don't even have to make the pirates that much stronger, just make it more believable that this is an impossible journey, and that Mando has actually accomplished something worth a full suit of Beskar. Taming a more fearsome beast would be a lot more impressive, and Mando having the patience to tame it would be a good way of showing why Mando is the only one in the guild who could complete this mission. But no. Mando needs to get his butt kicked by level 5 monsters because that's the laziest way of manufacturing tension that the writer could think of. And we need a nice barren desert planet because this is Star Wars, goddammit. They get to their destination and Discount Yoda finally explains why he's been helping Mando. You'd think Mando would have asked about that already, but I guess he's just a trusting person by nature. Bill explains that he helped because the bounty here has been attracting mercenaries and they've been causing a ruckus. He wants them off his lawn and the legendary warrior status of the Mandalorians makes him confident that Mando will succeed. And this is the second time he's refused payment and I can't wait to get a completely sensible payoff to this little setup. And here is our first instance of Mando's rifle despawning. He has it at the start of the second episode, so we know he didn't leave it with Discount Yoda, and his Blurg isn't around either by then, so we know he didn't leave it with the Blurg. He's got it one second, and then it's gone. He's using the scope that is attached to it usually, so am I meant to believe that he left it up on top of this cliff for safekeeping? Is that a thing? This is going to become a pattern, by the way. Mando scopes out the joint, and I appreciate appreciate him not rushing in. He wants the element of surprise and will likely wait for dark to close in. But as he peers through his scope, he spots an IG unit preparing to attack the fort. I'm not sure how this robot got the jump on everybody while he slowly approached the main entrance from this wide open valley, but it seems that the bandits didn't notice him until he was right on top of them. When the bandits do notice him, they take a page out of Mando's book and just stand there like NPCs. They continue to stand there as he announces himself with guns drawn. No one takes cover or goes, oh fuck, it's an IG unit. They just 
just have a three second standoff before one draws his gun and the droid kills them. The remaining bandits retreat inside and close the blast doors. Mando teleports down the hill and proceeds to jump out of cover shouting at the droid. What's happening now, D-Man? <laughs> What are you doing, Mando? Why would you sneak up on him like that? You were being smart and careful just seconds ago. At least the show punishes him for being stupid, kinda. I thought I was the only one on assignment. That makes two of us. Again, what is the point of being in the guild? They send additional hunters who you would presumably compete against or split the bounty with, and they don't even give you a call in advance? Maybe Mando really did spend several months training that blurg and the guild has presumed him dead? Speaking of, how did this guy get here? Where's his blurg? Also, is there a reason IG doesn't take cover? Why would you program your slow walking assassin droid to just stand out in the open during a firefight? I appreciate Mando sticking to cover and insisting on the droid doing the same. He also insists on coming up with a plan before the enemy re-engages. That's good. Those bounty hunter instincts seem to be kicking back in. I don't mind Mando making a truce with the droid, but I would have preferred if IG-88 had to talk him into it. It being Mando's idea just kind of ignores his supposed deep-seated droid prejudice. I kind of liked the speeder scene from before because even though it was framed as a joke, the idea that Mando would suffer any consequences for his droid prejudice was a cool one. But this is one of the first times it would be super, super relevant, and Mando just makes this alliance without any hesitation. I guess there's always next time. IG-88 actually appeared in Empire Strikes Back and is, unlike most droids, completely independent. My first thought when seeing a droid bounty hunter was that it was a souped up drone. Like, no one's ever gonna make an assassin droid and then just release it into the wild. And no one's gonna hire a free-range murder robot when they could just capture and reprogram it, especially not the Empire. Naturally, there would be a programmer or a master who sends this droid out on missions and keeps the money for himself. Perhaps this mystery hunter was once a hunter themselves, but is now wanted across the galaxy. This both explains the need for a droid bounty hunter as well as the droid's compulsion about self-destructing to prevent capture, since he could potentially be used to trace his master. This makes a lot of sense, so naturally the show decides to take a completely different approach. By all accounts, this is a droid gone rogue. Not sure why anyone would tolerate a rogue assassin droid, let alone hire one, but maybe this explains his eagerness to self-destruct at the first sign of capture? A droid like this would be under constant threat. Authorities made aware of this literal killing machine on the loose would naturally be trying to take him out of commission. Criminals would be repeatedly trying to kidnap and reprogram him, and racist Mandalorians might try to kill him and take his bounty. But no, the reason we get is it's part of his manufacturer's programming. Sadly, I must ask for your fob. I've already issued the writ of seizure. Oh, so you can call dibs if you file the paperwork beforehand? Wait, did Mando do that? Can we talk about this later? I require an answer. If I am to proceed. Shut up. It's time for more action. And we start with IG and Mando making their way to the blast doors, and this guy gets the jump on Mando, and why would you just push him, you fucking idiot? You see an armed bounty hunter with his back turned to you, and you decide to shove him instead of shooting him? Where even is your weapon? Do you not have one? Man, sure is lucky for Mando that the one guy who had him dead to rights is both unarmed and a dumbass. Oh look, the IG unit finally took cover. Oh, never mind. He's back to slowly walking again. Nonsensical approach aside, I really like the way the robot swivels his head and limbs around as he shoots. With how bad people are at aiming in this universe, having a robot designed to nail every shot is very satisfying to behold. The sequence isn't too bad, and Mando gets to flex his quickscope capabilities. It does bother me that they've put themselves here though. I'm just a filthy gamer, mind you, not an elite warrior, but even I know that pushing this far into enemy territory is a great way of getting trapped and subsequently killed. Being pinned down next to blast doors is a Star Wars staple though, so I guess we just had to do it this way. The bandits roll out a Gatling gun and corner our heroes. The IG unit seems really keen on killing himself. Relatable. Oh, he can run. Wow, look at him go. Mando uses this distraction to grapple the gun and yank the shooter off. Done quickly, this works, but I wish Mando had put a bit more force into this pull. Watching it back, I'm not convinced at all that this little yank whips this heavy-ass turret so hard that it throws this guy off. This is a problem with the entire sequence. Well, the entire show, really. If you pay attention to these action scenes, just about every sentient creature Mando faces manages to earn their death through sheer stupidity. Like here, when Mando takes control of the Gatling gun. Mando hits them all in one rotation, and despite none of them taking cover, not one of them manages to shoot Mando while keeping themselves fully exposed. Yeah, it happens in other Star Wars movies, but guess what? It's bad in other Star Wars movies, and it's bad here. You shouldn't always have to nerf the baddies to make your heroes look competent, especially when your hero is supposed to be an elite fighter. Besides, Mando's lesser Beskar can still block blaster shots. Why not take advantage of it and have him get hit at least a couple times? You know, you're not so bad. 
for a droid. Huh, so Mando is just a casual racist. That blaster head looks nasty, you okay? He just met this literal assassin droid and is already warming up to him. So I guess Mando's droid problem is more of a minor inconvenience rather than a lifelong phobia spawned from the death of his parents. If I was in the writing room, I would have had the client basically force Mando to work with the IG unit and then have them do something infinitely more interesting than blurg writing to get here. Mando warming up to an assassin droid he is forced to work with could have been at least an entire episode. You know, just give them more time to interact so Mando softening up feels earned. This can be said for a lot of payoffs in the show. Some of the best ideas are paid off, but the payoffs occur so early on in the story that they carry a fraction of their potential impact. In cases like this, they happen so early there isn't even a proper setup to speak of, so I can't even consider it a payoff. The boys decide to shoot the door open, and what was that thing Karga said about? They don't mind if things get sloppy. What is this, if not sloppy? Why would you cut a hole in the door with a turret? Who knows what's in here? You could have hit a container of hyperfuel and leveled the whole damn building. You could have killed a bounty and ended the entire show right here. Mando wants that higher payout that comes with bringing it in alive, so why not be a bit less risky? They could have at least checked for another way in rather than immediately resorting to this. But I guess we just had to have this epic entrance. It looks cool, but walking in fully exposed seems stupid. Mando was just being cautious and taking cover a minute ago, but now he's posing up a storm now next to his new bestie. I mean, shit, I guess he was doing that a minute ago too. The straggler that Mando shoots here might have lived if he hadn't exposed his entire body in a similarly boneheaded fashion, but he's not a named character, so rather than getting dinged in the chest or the shoulder, he gets to be killed for doing stupid shit. They find the bounty and, oh my god, it's adorable. I take back every mean thing I ever said. Also, what another great idea. I can't wait to see how this one gets wasted. The commission was quite specific. The asset was to be terminated. Mando was given the same job from the same guild and the same client and told dead or alive. Why was the robot told to kill Baby Yoda? Also, why doesn't Mando try to reason with him? The IG unit has basically been obeying him since he showed up, so why not tell him you have conflicting information and should take it back alive just to be safe? Did Mando spontaneously remember that he hates droids? We get that final shot of Baby Yoda and Mando reaching out to each other and the episode ends. What a confusing mess. Remember at the beginning of the video when I said consistency in stories is super important? Well, I gave examples that I said said were mostly about world building and plot, but what about characters? Well, the same reasoning applies to them. When you establish that a character is a certain way, you should do your very best to adhere to that. Let's look at Mando's characterization. When he sticks to cover and makes good tactical decisions, it tells me he's experienced and competent. But then I see him leaving his weapons unlocked, and I see him arriving on a planet completely unprepared and getting his ass handed to him by fishosaurs. When he opts for a worse speeder without a droid, it tells me this guy must really hate droids. But then when he so quickly makes an alliance with an IG unit, it tells me he really doesn't have that much of a problem with them at all. We have badass Mando, and then we have bumbling Mando. We have droid hating Mando, and then we have droid tolerant Mando. We have careful Mando, and then we have careless Mando. Who this guy is depends entirely on what the writers want to happen on a moment to moment basis. I can't connect with him because he doesn't feel human. He feels like a glorified prop. But hey, I'm sure episode two gets much better. Right? Right? Wrong! Mando makes his way back to his ship, and it's a little weird how lax he is. No weapons drawn, and the baby carrier is wide open. What if a blurg attacks you, Mando? Wait, Mando, where's your blurg? How are you gonna make this impossible journey without your trusty blurg? The shadows moving before Mando hears the attackers is a neat detail. Oh, forget the shadow, you can actually see their reflection in Mando's helmet. That's cool. It's also cool to see Mando being hyper aware of his surroundings. If only he was always like this. What follows is a pretty good fight scene, or that's what I would have said if I had only watched it once. This fight scene is fast and Mando gets to show off a bit, but that's it. It's just a minute or so of snappy editing and half-baked choreography. There's even a moment where Mando disarms one of them and now has a vibro axe, but the show just despawns the axe before he can do anything with it. Watch, he's got it one second and then it just disappears. In spite of his weapon disappearing, Mando gets to be a badass and use his own equipment effectively. Movie magic trickery aside, this is a much more convincing display of his legendary skills than the blurg fight from earlier. Not sure why all these guys are packing vibro axes instead of guns though. And why does number three decide to bum rush Baby Yoda after Mando pulls the gun out? Why not help your friends kill the actual threat? You literally ran behind Mando on your way to kill the baby with his back turned to you. We see a tracking fob on the ground confirming that these are other hunters. And it is neat how the fob's beeping blends with the Mando theme. 
these next two minutes are surprisingly flawless. It's nothing Oscar worthy, but the music is on point and even if it isn't intentional, there's some substance to be drawn from it. Mando sits there patching up his wounds and you get the feeling this isn't out of the ordinary for him. Later on, we don't see him get proper treatment for this wound, probably because the writers forgot about it, but a more charitable reading is that this is Mando's style. This is his thing, his issue. Rather than getting help, he insists on doing things on his own, regardless of how ill-equipped he might be. When Baby Yoda tries to help him, he's not just foreshadowing force healing, he's demonstrating that he already sees Mando as his protector. He's showing Mando more trust and compassion than he's probably seen in quite some time, and when Mando shuts the baby carrier, he's showing how closed off he is to connecting with others. Sadly, this is not the case. Mando teams up with and puts his trust in random people constantly, even droids. He makes friends very quickly, and his conflict with his fellow Mandalorians amounts to one sparring session with Big Chungo. In hindsight, this scene is still spotless, but lacks most of the meaning I thought it had when I first saw it. This isn't really meant to tell us anything about Mando's character, other than he's not attached to the baby he just met. I mean, the transition is neat, though. The music, per usual, is fucking crazy. If there is one aspect of this show that truly holds up, it's the soundtrack. It reminds me a lot of the prequel music, and I don't mean in terms of style, I mean how it just kicks into 10th gear for no reason. This is the actual title of this track. When Mando returns to his ship, he sees it's being stripped by Jawas. Even from this distance, you can see holes in it, so we know it's not spaceworthy. You'd think Discount Yoda would have warned Mando about local Jawas, but I guess not. This is also confirmation that Mando not only parks his ship unreasonable distances from his objective, but also does nothing to prevent it from getting vandalized while he's away, even though later in the finale, Engage ground security protocols. Nothing on this planet will breach those doors. But this scene kind of confirms that that's not not the case. Mando doesn't bother with any kind of automated defenses, and he doesn't bother with any kind of recon or research before parking in territory completely unfamiliar to him. But hey, that's nerd shit that I guess bounty hunters are too cool to worry about. Mando sizes up the situation, and what he does next isn't completely brain dead, but still very, very questionable. He doesn't get any closer before he snipes three of them with his rifle. The Jawas hop in their crawler and boogie out of there. Mandalorian makes chase and tries to slow it down, but to no avail. He then decides to jump on board, and I I appreciate the Jawas having the sense to try and scrape him off. Mando squeezing into cover at the last second is also pretty cool. The Jawas make some feeble attempts at stopping him and he reaches the top, only to be met with this. It was at this moment that he knew. He fucked up. Armor or not, this fall would break something, unless Mando's spine is made of Beskar. So what was the plan here? Was he just gonna go on a Jawa killing spree till they agreed to surrender his parts? I get that someone stripping your vehicle for parts might provoke an impulsive reaction, but this is a prime example of Mando behaving like a newbie or civilian, rather than a seasoned spacefarer. He may not have been expecting this, but he had several advantages when he arrived, and he wasted all of them. If you're gonna chase them, why not get closer before firing? They don't even know you're there yet, so why not sneak on to the crawler and sabotage it so they can't drive away. I mean, shit, maybe just try approaching them? The Jawas aren't blameless either, by the way. Why are you guys throwing shit and poking him with zappy sticks instead of shooting him? If any of the Jawas that poked their heads out of these little windows actually had a stun gun, Mando's little escapade would have ended a lot earlier. And when he falls down and goes into a coma from his spinal injury, why don't you guys pull over and take his armor? I mean, if you're not interested in looting him, then at least avenge your fallen Jawa brethren. Put that puppy in reverse and pop him like a zit. But hey, I'm just some guy on the internet. Let's hear what another guy on the internet has to say about this scene. The chase and then climb up the sand crawler is hilarious. Oh, he agrees? He hurts his fingies, gets electrocuted, he's having junk thrown down on him, and then that one canister bonks him right in the head. Oh, weird. He's describing it like he knows it's dumb, but he likes that it's dumb? He gets his butt kicked by Jawas. It's so undignified. Uh, yeah, that's a pretty fair assessment. But that is, again, the point. What? This line of work is beneath him and Mandalorian kind. What? How do you say he gets his butt kicked by Jawas two seconds before this line of work is beneath him? It seems more like he's the one beneath this line of work. This isn't even a part of his bounty mission. This is just a local band of scavengers griefing his ship. Mando wakes up and returns to what's left of his ship. The damage is extensive and Mando is stranded. To think this might have all been avoided if Mando had just owned a land speeder. Most of this mission has consisted of blurg training, blurg writing, and blurgless walking. Mando could have been back in time to prevent most of, if not all of the damage. Discount Yoda tells him he can trade with the Jawas to get his parts back. I feel like Mando should know this, but maybe he's not familiar with Jawas? You can trade with Jawas? 
Are you out of your mind? So he is familiar, but somehow thinks the idea of trading with them is ridiculous? Why? That's their thing. Mando knows fucking Tusken Raider sign language. How has he never traded with a Jawa before? The negotiations commence, and the Jawas try to trade the ship parts for Mando's Beskar. Wait, they do want the Beskar? Why didn't you just take it earlier when he was knocked out? <laughs> Wait, he can speak Jawa, but still thinks trading with them is unheard of? What the fuck is happening? You understand this? Holy shit, Mando, are you out of your mind? Thank god this Jawa has ninja-like reflexes. Thank god the other Jawas don't take this attempt on their leader's life seriously. He is so lucky that any negotiating happened beyond this point. The Jawas brush it off, and when it becomes clear that Mando has nothing to trade, they ask for a favor instead. They want him to retrieve the egg. They bring him to the cave, and what follows is probably one of the earliest character assassinations I've ever seen in a show. I'm kind of reluctant to even call it that, since Mando's characterization has been very inconsistent so far already, but the show has tried desperately to tell you that this man is a badass. He's been at this for a long time, he's well trained and well equipped, He's the best in the goddamn parsec. That man, if he ever truly existed, is officially killed before the scene and discreetly replaced with this idiot. I can forgive the Blurg battle and I can forget the Jawa Joust, but Mudhorn Mania is the scene where I refuse to be told Mando is even kinda good at what he does. This is not the worst of what the show has on offer. Far from it, in fact. But this is supposed to be a pivotal moment and it is pure, unfermented, Piss. We find out in a later episode that Mando has night vision and thermals built into his helmet, so I don't know why he busts out a fucking flashlight here. And entering this cave with a flashlight is beyond stupid. Why not place charges outside of the cave and lure the Mudhorn out? You only care about killing it to get the egg, so just blow it the fuck up. Instead of entering this little boss arena, maybe perch above it and take the creature out from a distance. Again, after luring it out of the cave. One shot to the Mudhorn's giant target of a body should disintegrate more than enough body mass to kill it. Hell, maybe you could have gone into the cave like you did, still not advisable, but instead of having your blaster drawn, maybe just have your insta-kill weapon at the ready? How unfortunate the Mando only draws his insta-kill weapon after it's been jammed with mud. Mamma mia, what a mess. Something funny about this show is how often it inadvertently highlights Mando's stupid decisions by actually having him get punished for them. Done right, this is kind of good, this is what you want to see happen, you want to see characters kind of pay for their mistakes and learn from them, but Mando never fucking learns because he never acknowledges when he's totally blundered. He is put himself in such a vulnerable position that once he loses both of his guns, he's basically dead. Luckily for Mando, the Mudhorn simply can't penetrate his super thick plot armor. Another win for that Beskar spine. I appreciate him trying his flamethrower, it's probably his best bet at this point, and oh, he's out of juice. That's what you get for wasting it on goddamn Jawas, you fucking cabbage. He then shoots the beast with his grappling hook. He knows he's dead, so I guess he's just button mashing at this point. Things go about as well as you would expect, and Mando prepares to accept his much-earned, much-deserved death. It's supposed to be tense, but obviously the writers are going to step in and bail him out. Was the audience seriously meant to believe that the Mandalorian might die in the second episode of his own show on a side quest given to him by Jawas? But how is Mando saved? Well, Baby Yoda uses the Force. It's played as a big reveal, and I guess that's kind of fine. Mando wasn't expecting it. So yeah, I guess treating this like a bit of a surprise is okay. But the real surprise here is how easily this level 80 Mudhorn dies from a single stab from a vibro knife. Wow, amazing. This is a lot of force power for a little baby. I do like that they balance it out by having Baby Yoda get tired every time he exerts himself like this, but when directly comparing this to this, he just seems a little too overpowered. Also, Discount Yoda clearly knows what the egg and presumably the Mudhorn are. Was there no equipment or advice he could give? Maybe give him some of those nifty Blurg tranquilizers? Good god, what a travesty of a scene. The Jawas enthusiastically eating the egg is funny, and I like it. Seeing the boys share a fresh meal together always warms my cold, dead heart. This next conversation is fine, even if it is bare bones. We get a cute little ship repair montage, and as usual, the music is fucking bopping. I will say, with how many days this must have taken, it is odd that no more hunters come for Baby Yoda. Mando tries to pay Quill again, and Quill says, No, you are my guest, and I am in your service. Mando then says, You should join my crew. I can pay really well. With what money, Mando? You apparently can't even afford a speeder bike. Also, I guess Mando isn't the solo act I thought he was. He's very quick to team up with droids, despite supposedly hating them, and he's pretty quick to offer Quill a spot on his ship. To be fair, Quill has been ludicrously helpful, so this isn't a dumb move by any means. It just makes it seem like Mando has no issue accepting help when he 
needs it, even though I thought that's what we might be setting up with that one good scene from earlier. Also, that's the end of episode two. It's really short despite being Mando's only real opportunity to connect with Grogu before he has to turn him in, but who wants to see a character's rough exterior get gradually chipped away by another character? That shit's boring. I hope you all enjoyed seeing Mando get his ass handed to him by Jawas and a space rhino. Really makes me believe he's the best bounty hunter in the parsec. Remember back at the start of this video? The choice to have the droid speeder be shiny and new while the human speeder is falling apart is played for a joke. The speeder doesn't break down or anything, but it could have, and that's a risk Mando was eager to take. Mando paying extra for a worse ride is a great way of foreshadowing that his droid prejudice is a character flaw that will both impact his decision making and potentially provide consequences for him to grow from. Even though the speeder doesn't break down and Mando doesn't lose his bounty, this innocent taxi driver bites the bullet and Mando never once expresses remorse over his death. Had Mando settled for the droid piloted speeder, this innocent man would still be alive, and Mando never once reflects on or even realizes that his droid phobia got an innocent human killed. This is not good foreshadowing. It's incredible foreshadowing. It tells you right away that the writers were so incompetent that they will accidentally make Mando's actions have consequences and still fail to have Mando learn from or even acknowledge his mistakes. As soon as Mando's prejudice should be a serious problem, it suddenly vanishes, and all of his character traits, if I can even call them that, are treated this way. Mando is allowed to be a badass only if and when the plot requires it of him. As soon as we have a scene where he needs to lose, he goes from a bounty hunter to a bounty blunder, an ineffective and unqualified hack, just like his two dads. When Mando does get to be a badass, the creators don't know how to make him seem strong and intelligent without making all of his enemies weak and incompetent. So even when Mando is doing something that should be impressive, it's made far less impressive when you realize just one competent hostile would be able to kill him. If it hasn't become very obvious by now, I find this show kind of frustrating. The best it can do is tease and distract you well enough that you never notice how paper thin every aspect of the writing is. The plot, the characters, the world building, it's all incoherent nonsense. And I will reiterate, you don't have to be dumb to like or even love this show, but please refrain from calling the story in it good. These episodes cost 15 million a piece to make, Disney is worth more than 200 billion dollars, and Star Wars is the biggest film franchise in history. The standard for the writing should be much higher, and until it is, I'm afraid we're only going to keep getting half-assed stories with half-baked characters. Stop telling Disney that shows like Mando Season 1 are basically perfect because there is more than enough room for improvement, and acknowledging that is important. This company is more than capable of delivering quality when it deems it necessary, and this franchise deserves so much better. We made it to the end folks, thank you all for watching. I put a lot of work into this video and I am sorry to my subs who were hoping for something more positive regarding this first season. One of the reasons I decided to prioritize this video was to make it clear to anyone interested in following my coverage that my goal when assessing media is to remain as objective as possible and break things down mechanically. In my Blackwater video, I had mostly positive things to say as that episode is very tightly written and directed, but I did stop and criticize a few things because I did spot objective flaws. And the whole point of my videos is probing story elements mechanically to see if they hold up under closer inspection. In the case of an early Game of Thrones episode, this method will tend to reveal the story succeeding on several layers that may not have been apparent on a first viewing. In the case of a Mandalorian episode, my method yields the opposite result. While I stopped to praise several parts of the production and direction, just about every time I explored the writing, it revealed that the story was failing on several layers that may not have been apparent on a first viewing. I think any story worth your time should get better upon closer inspection, not worse and I wouldn't be doing my job if I simply ignored all the issues in the show and told you it's good because I like it. As for future videos, I won't be touching Mando for a while. My videos take a long time to make, and I know some of you are starving for more Best of Thrones. The rest of Best of Thrones videos will be in chronological order, so the next video will be covering Season 1, Episode 5, The Wolf and the Lion. After that, I have a few ideas, but nothing is set in stone yet. My plan right now is for every other video I make to be a Best of Thrones video, with other films and shows being covered in between. I do have a list of episodes and other media I currently plan to cover on my community tab if you're interested, but it's also right here if you want to just pause the video. I'll be covering Arcane, Andor, How to Train Your Dragon, House of the Dragon, and Severance. If it hasn't become apparent yet, I like to go in depth and my videos require an ungodly amount of editing, so I don't expect to be pumping out content any quicker than monthly for the foreseeable future. If the channel gains enough steam, I would be happy to commit more time to producing content quicker, but for the time being, I will warn any subs that my upload schedule is going to 
going to be less than ideal. If you're at all interested in supporting my work, a like, subscribe, or comment would be greatly appreciated. I also have a Patreon link in the description if you're interested in supporting the channel. As of this video's release, I will be adding a new benefit to the higher tiers. For those tiers, you will receive a personalized Saint Wombat. Just message me with your color preferences and any design changes you would like to make, and I'll send you your very own customized Saint Wombat in glorious PNG format. And who knows, maybe your Wombat will show up in a future video. I hope you enjoyed, and if not, let me know why in the comments. I'm always looking to improve, so any feedback is appreciated. For anyone still here, thank you so, so much for sticking around. I really can't express how cool it is that literally anyone wants to hear me talk about media for more than five minutes, so the fact that you've been here for an hour is amazing. I'll see you in the next video. Take care, you blurgs.